So they're <laughs> NFTs, was it non-fungible tokens or yes. what they're sold for? Yeah. And it's really funny because I think it was, um, I follow a bunch of different news outlets that are art specific. And on April Fool's Day, uh, an outlet called Hyperallergic put out an article that said, uh, we spoke to a bunch of curators and art professionals about NFTs and no one knows what they are. And I thought it was a serious article because in my world, none of us know what they are. But the article was a joke for April Fool's right. Day. Mm -hmm. But it's not. At the <laughs> it's not. Oh, the no, sick and twisted I, joke was that. Like, what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow. It's crazy. I had a hard time wrapping my brain around it, too. Because, mm -hmm. like, we were just talking about ownership of art and that tangibility. But here's literally something that is, in many ways, intangible and that anyone can have a replica of in some manner by just accessing it for free online. And so I don't know. Um, I think that's something that is going to be like something that we come back to historically in 10, 20 years. True. And I don't know if it's a fad. I know in a lot of ways, the bubble financially seems to be bursting already, mm. but I have no computer. This there we <laughs> go. It's not recording. Now it is so so something. 91, 291 of eight of the show. Ooh. We need this 291 days now. Oh, wow. This is our yeah, first time in North Carolina, Raleigh with Woo. Jennifer DeSalle. Uh, taking all the 50 the states, boys, all 50 yeah. of them. Right, That's so we're in North Carolina, <laughs> not that far from South. Who knows? Maybe we'll get it. But more importantly, we're joined by yes. Jennifer and our very own Saeed Jamal. Been here for a couple Thanks. episodes. You don't know who he is by now. That's really on you. But Jennifer, <laughs> welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Yes. Go ahead and let the world Thank know you. who you are and what you do. I am Jennifer Dassel. I am the host and creator of the podcast Art Curious, mm -hmm. and I also wrote a book of the same name called Art Curious. And I am a curator at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, happy to meet you guys. Happy to be amazing. Well, happy to have I'm you happy on the to show. Meet you. Right. Yes. Explain to a bunch <laughs> of Arabs what Art Curious means, because we just really don't like. We I I've yet to figure this out. It's all good. I kind of just came up with it as a catch all for anybody or in anything who might be of interest to you. So like, you don't have to be a serious art lover. You don't have to be somebody who gets into the nitty gritty of art and art history. I just want you to be maybe interested in an interesting story about art history. Mm -hmm. So that's what the background to Art Curious is. Mm -hmm. I started the show about five years ago, um, really just with the intention of opening up art a little bit to more people because um, I feel like in my everyday travels, just as a curator, you know, I meet somebody and they say, oh, what do you do? And I tell them I work at the art museum and they always seem to either be on one end of a spectrum or the other and hardly often, like rarely in the middle. So they'll say, oh, I love art. I listen to art podcasts all the time. I go to see every exhibition I can. I subscribe to all these magazines. I love art. And then on the other side, there's people who say like, oh, I went to the museum one time because my mom wanted me to go, you know, or they say, oh, the art's fine, but I'm really into the hamburgers at the restaurant, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand both viewpoints because I have lived both viewpoints. I used to not be into art at all um, and sort of fell into it in college. Like this was never my life's plan uh, to be an art historian and a curator. So I got into it because people started telling me good stories. I had good professors who were really exciting and enthusiastic and they got me much. interested. And then the stories are what's most exciting about art. Uh, I want to pause this recording, Ali, if possible. I do want to say- uh, Ooh, Just like that, okay, oops. Uh, Technical yes, difficulties, uh, but we are back. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I do want to say, I do want to um, thank you for making the podcast. Your podcast is really cool. I think the world needs more art and more people talking about art. Um, the world, a lot of times I feel it's like becoming more ones and zeros and everyone so serious all the time. And I think art's a great expression of our humanity. When people talk about art and do art, it's kind of the most amazing thing. True, that's very um, true. So, I totally uh, agree. <laughs> and thank you for your kind words. I know it's, um, I feel like there's so much priority, like you're talking about with the ones and zeros. It's like, uh, there's so much emphasis on science and technology, and math, but you don't hear a lot about anything in the creative or cultural realms. Um, and that's a shame because I feel like it really narrows us down as 
people as humanity uh, because we're so much more than that. And one of the major things that sets us aside, I think, from other creatures is our ability to create just for the sake of it. And I think that's really cool. It is. Um, it, is our podcast art? <laughs> sure. I like. think so. I mean, <laughs> my museum art critic. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Totally. Because your your media, your press, you're doing something that makes you happy. You're creative. You're putting it out into the world. I think why not? Yeah, maybe 100 There years down the line it's <laughs> for podcasters. As well. An artist. <laughs> hey, right? that is something that I think is really interesting that people have been talking about. I mean, really for almost over a hundred years now, but the idea of like, who gets to say what art is and who gets to say who's an artist. And if you are calling yourself an artist, then you're an artist, period. I guess yeah. that's how it works. An artist. Artist. I'm an artist, <laughs> right. take that. So um, add it to your resume. Oh, uh, my... shit. Oops. Uh, Going on that point, by the way, where you said like, when someone says they, they can be an artist and you're not, they're an artist, but basically like, when someone wants to you know make something public or something like existing or coining a term or making something like uh, like as an actual okay i don't know how to how creating a new to, movement in art right or yeah exactly like yeah. basically you you just have to say what it is explain it to people and if you mm -hmm. get a following it's gonna it's gonna exist <laughs> much. that's yeah, yeah. Well, guys, those guys were rejected for so long all those original <laughs> it's artists. <true. laughs> and then after you know many years after is when they really took off really it's wild that's the thing i think it's um finding that what am i i don't even know what i'm trying to say now but yeah i think you're totally right in that you can do something and whether or not you get a following is one thing and then having people come at you 25, 30, 35 years later and say like, that was a big moment. That's a different thing. And that's something none of us have control over. So you never know what's going to hit. And that I think is something that I find really challenging in that I focus a lot on contemporary art yes. in my day job at the museum. And so it's like, when you're bringing in a work for exhibition, or especially if you're trying to get a work into the permanent collection of a museum, you're basically taking a as educated a gamble as you can, but it's a gamble. Because <laughs> it's you gambling. Don't yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, so, wait, like... so, so we, do we actually not have control over it? Like, obviously, <laughs> at the, the current present time, you right. don't have control over if, if something blows up or not. But yeah. the thing is, I feel like people who are passionate about what they do and they put in all of this effort and to make something really good, especially from their own work, if not in the present time, it, it becoming something great, Later on, it will become great just because of how much effort they put in. So I feel like no, even if it's something, you know, very new and uh, someone is being a pioneer in their work, they still it's still going to become something just because they put the effort to make it something. Because people will obviously relate to it and then they're going to be like, I could have thought of that. I could have done the same thing, but I didn't. But th that pioneer is the one who's who made the first step. Totally. I think there's a meme that I've seen forever or or even just stories that people say where if you're looking at a painting by Jackson Pollock, for example, where it's just, you know, splatters of, well, it's what a lot of people think of as just splatters of paint <laughs> on the wall or on the canvas. And the automatic response so many times is like, oh, my five-year-old can do that. And you're like, well, yeah, but, but did he, he didn't. Your five-year-old didn't. <laughs> <But> did <he? laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, it's exactly like you're saying, Saeed, it's like, the person who did it first, that's the rule breaker. That's the trendsetter. That's the person that made this moment happen. Mm. Um, yeah, why, it's crazy. Uh, why is that so important in art? Like, why is the original always the most important? Like the original uh, Mona Lisa <laughs> is yeah. what's really the one that's the most amazing one, but every single copy of it yeah. is not really that interesting. <laughs> I, know, I know it's yeah. true. I guess there has to, there's a lot to be said about originality and about pushing the boundaries and trying something different. I think that's the thing is like, we're always interested in novelty as people. Like I think we crave as humans crave newness and change and something different. That doesn't mean we'll necessarily like it, but um, I think it's really interesting. I think that's what we want is this drive to push things further. I think for oh, me, wow. like what I, I, how I would answer that is basically saying, cause maybe the Mona Lisa was Like with any art, any art I've ever like liked or actually appreciated, I enjoyed more the story behind the art nah. more than the actual art itself. Because 
a lot of people painted kings, queens, and people back in the days, right? Like it's something you yep. see all over the time. But the story behind the Mona Lisa is why it is what it is today, right? Absolutely. I think that's how I would argue it. But uh, in terms of Fair that, point, like, yeah. it's it's also to do with intricacy and integration of different. Like we've always separated science and art throughout all of our history, right? But there are these few key moments in our history where art and science just collided to become this one beautiful thing that is art with a background of like a little bit of science. Cause I've watched this video before where it's like, they show how the Mona Lisa is like super symmetrical with all these different like squares, triangles and right. You've never seen it. You've I've actually never seen, never seen it. it. I'll send you that video later. <laughs> while it's it's really brilliant. cool. It's, yes. a, it's right. amazing, wow. right? It's like, mm -hmm. and it, cause it was painted by, uh, Da Vinci. Yes, Da Vinci, right? <laughs> and yeah. uh, the guy was yeah. literally everything. He was he was he was an anatomist, a scientist yeah. of many different forms. He, he was, was an architect was, as well. He was an architect. Yeah. And the guy just painted this Mona Lisa thing, right? He's, he's like, <laughs> but there you go. I just I did that, right? And it's crazy. It is. It's just like, and now it's like worth how much is the Mona Lisa worth? Let me let me find the exact numbers. Because that's uh, just out of the park. I think it's priceless. Uh, I think it's priceless, man. It's a national heritage. And stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know Francis numbers. is going to give it away. <laughs> <an> Google. <laughs> Check this out. How much would it cost? Wow. A hundred million dollars. Million to eight fifty million. But That's that was in nineteen sixty-two. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. Uh, it's now eight hundred and fifty million. It's now eight hundred fifty million dollars. Whoa. That's Just a lot. for and then that. Down below, it says that uh, it might be worth at least three billion, or three point three billion dollars. Uh, uh, three billion. Wow. I don't know where the. Like, okay. Who's gonna pay that much in an auction? <laughs> you know how many rich. All right, Jennifer. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, why do people like collecting all these cool art pieces of art? You know, I think I think there's a lot to be said for like the tangible ownership of a work of art. Like people mm. want to be able, not necessarily to touch it. Like I wouldn't recommend touching a painting. <laughs> <laughs> really fingers, all of us got them, even if they're clean, it's like it will damage oil paint. But I think it's just that moment of being able to say like, I, I own this thing, this is mine. Right and being able to claim it in a way that is separate from being able to go see it at a museum. I love museums in that you have that moment of being like, this belongs to everyone. It's a cultural treasure, like you guys are saying. Um, but being able to buy something and then and have the power to hang it on your wall or place it on a pedestal in your living room, that's a different thing. So let me ask I you this. Don't collect art, so. Ah, uh, yes. that ruins the question I was gonna ask you. I was oh, gonna I'm literally definitely... ask you if you could <laughs> own any artwork or any piece of painting to have ever existed what would it be if i was to pick just one yeah like just one and you get to have it for free <laughs> and put it in your place hang it up on a wall maybe i don't know oh my gosh keep it in I your feel bed like maybe i never like actually it. thought that question i've been really? studying art <laughs> <laughs> glad to be the first to I, ask you i know on a to the show <laughs> this is like that first moment we're talking about originality like here you go you yeah. you did an original thing you're this is your artistic moment that is my um, yeah. i'm an artist because i said so <laughs> there you go right, right so i feel like i'm kind and of we have the boring. followers to prove it what was that i'm sorry no i was saying we have the followers to prove it so <laughs> <laughs> like him you put it out there um i feel like in terms of my personal interest in art i'm kind of boring in that a lot of the art that I love, I wouldn't necessarily want to put on my walls. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff that I love is probably like really minor and low key. Like I love drawings and I love prints. So those are really tiny and fragile and you know more ephemeral than a painting or a sculpture. I love photographs. And I think I really like the intimacy of a small object. So mm -hmm. probably I'd have some random drawing if it was by leonardo or michelangelo or somebody i think that would be pretty cool um oh, huge flex. like the ones behind you. <laughs> huge flex just to have that. the drawing the pictures behind you are those oh. the one, uh, examples yeah those are pictures of my family and my friends <laughs> yes yeah, that's, that's pretty cool that's that's still art for me it'd be any bob <laughs> any bob ross painting would do for me like any bob oh, ross man. painting 
Bob Ross is the man. Bob Ross is the man. It's crazy. The way I fell on Bob Ross or discovered Bob Ross was just very weird. I have trouble sleeping sometimes. Very sad, yeah. I know. But <laughs> how I found him was I was literally like on YouTube and it was one of those 3 a.m. on YouTube moments. I was like, Bob Ross. I mean, I've heard a lot about him. Let's give him a try. Yeah. I mean, I slept, but I woke up to this beautiful painting. I was like, wait, this guy was literally drawing <laughs> a bunch of like lines and shit on like, it was very simple. How do you make it look like that? You know what I mean? And it's crazy. He's he's the living proof that anyone can paint or be it's an true. artist. He, he's it's like, true. well, not living anymore, RIP, right? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, you know. But he mean. was so positive too. Like that's what I think is also so wonderful about Bob Ross is that he was so like quietly supportive mm. of you, the viewer in general, where it was like, just do this little bit and if you mess it up, it's okay. Like it's so calming. There's no so mistakes, I totally agree with you. just happy little accidents. Exactly. Yep. And that's like um, a really wonderful way to go through life, thinking about happy little accidents. It really is. And it's crazy. Honestly, like even a story. Um, I've been a great parent, to be honest. <laughs> I've been a very, yeah. <laughs> optimistic guy. Very optimistic. Um, what about you guys? Jennifer, what art would you own? Um, I want to I wanna just jump right into the hard question. All right, go ahead. Some stuff. <laughs> we got to get an <laughs> exclusive on into the show. Fine, fine, fine. Um, Do it. All right. Have you ever heard of Nyan Cat, Jennifer? Oh, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. Cat. Oh, it's an internet meme. All right, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> I don't know up. if you've heard. I, I know if you've heard. All right, of what um, this new trend where people are buying digital art for yes. hundreds yeah. of thousands of millions of dollars. Yeah. So let me show you this. Uh, Nyan Cat went for five hundred thousand dollars. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Why is this happening? I just didn't recognize <laughs> it by name, but I yes. recognize the image. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's what's it's literally happening? a gif? That's, <laughs> yeah. that's it. It's just a gif. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. it's so weird. So they're mm -hmm. NFTs. Was it non fungible tokens or yes. what they're sold for? Yeah. And it's really funny because I think it was. Um, I follow a bunch of different news outlets that are art specific. And on April Fool's Day, uh, an outlet called Hyperallergic put out an article that said. Uh, we spoke to a bunch of curators and art professionals about NFTs and no one knows what they are. And I thought it was a serious article because in my world, none of us know what they are. But the article was a joke for April Fool's right. Day. Mm -hmm. But it's not. At the same <laughs> time. It's not. And a no, sick and twisted I, joke was that. Like, what? <laughs> I know. Was, <laughs> wow. It's I crazy. Have a hard time wrapping my brain around it, too because mm -hmm. like we were just talking about ownership of art and that tangibility but here's literally something that is in many ways intangible and that anyone can have a replica of in some manner by just accessing it for free online so i don't know um i think that's something that is gonna be like something that we come back to historically in 10 20 years True. And I don't know if it's a fad. I know in a lot of ways, the bubble financially seems to be bursting already, mm. but I have no idea. It's sort of like beyond my knowledge in many ways. Oh, wow. Maybe that makes but you did mention, you did mention like people like change. And mm -hmm. in a sense, yeah. this is, this is change. This is the evolution of art and it's basically going digital. I mean, a lot of things yeah. are going digital these days and I'm guessing one of them is art. So. Totally how how are you adapting maybe to to this change i would say um on the curatorial side so like the museum side definitely when everything shut down because of covid we moved into an entirely virtual space and so it wasn't necessarily creating art virtually um but it's basically opening up the world of art and exploring it in different ways and so things that we never did before that are fairly normal, I would say to many people in different realms, like um, creating a Spotify playlist based on what might inspire you when you're looking at a painting, for example. It's not hard and it's not revolutionary, but it's something that, for example, we'd never done at my museum before. Mm -hmm. And so I think just opening things up and explaining it in a different way is part of what we're trying to do. Um, yeah, but I think there's also that interest in expanding your own personal knowledge of art away from something that's like heavy handed historical, like this is what art means stuff and more about the enjoyment of it. So like the Spotify playlist or making a coloring book of works in the collection and letting people have them for free. It's like, these are just different ways to connect 
with creativity. And in the past, I think there was this really rigid sense of like, that that's not what art is and art is meaning. And it was very like sturdy and firm and um, people are doing something different now. And I really love that. I feel like I'm still in that kind of headspace where art has to have meaning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. man, I think it's because for me, I really do appreciate the story behind the art. But since we're talking about art history, uh, sometimes in history, you can see a pattern of change. And that mm -hmm. can lead to sometimes like the more you indulge and dive into the patterns, the more you can tell where this pattern is going. Right. So yeah. I kind of want to ask you, since you're so into history of art, where do you think art is going in the future? Oh man. Oh, I feel like we've had conversations. Like I've had discussions with other curators about this. And I think it's definitely in a place where we're trying to accept things that are more digital, that are more um, interested in blurring the lines between all those like traditional art modes. Mm -hmm. So there used to be this really interesting split between art or what was considered like fine art versus craft or something that was like an applied arts. So where fine art would basically just be like art for art's sake, art to make things look pretty or to hang in a museum. The other side was that it's like, if you sculpted like a really beautiful wooden spoon, people would be like, yeah, that's great, but it's a spoon, it's not art. I feel yeah. like that line is so quickly disappearing. And I think the NFTs kind of play into that a little bit as well, because it's like, is this, just a fun graphic thing or is it art and all of a sudden it gets to be both um so i think that's one of the big things is that blurring of the boundaries is really big mm -hmm. would you say they're giving value to any kind of art these days like they're giving art they're giving value to for example that you gave an example of a wooden spoon and it's like people are saying like this is art like, is the, are they just throwing the the, the value right. of art or, or everything is art <laughs> yeah yeah it's like I feel like that's such a hard question because like, mm. yes, I sort of think that's true. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, I think it again comes back to the question that we talked about earlier, where it's like, but who gets to decide? Um, mm. I don't know a really good, like solid answer for that one. But I think it's, um, I'm thinking a lot about things like design exhibitions and fashion exhibitions. And those have been like hugely on the rise in art museums in the last 10 years. And that was not a thing that would have ever been considered 30 years ago, 50 years ago at most major museums around the world. And now they're like super standard and people love wow. them. Um, but when was that, like, when did that moment happen that people in power in the art world were like, oh, we should do this. Um, and I don't know when that was, but I feel like that's sort of the evolution is like, everybody has to catch up. And then at some point, somebody in a big museum position is just going to be like, okay, this is the new thing. Even though I bet you most of the everyday people like us would be like, well, yeah, we were interested in that 20 years ago. <laughs> right. So, I don't know. It's like the art world is weird with this power dynamics. And, you know, it's so much of it is just based on money and it's, it's hard and weird and it changes and it's dizzy and crazy making for sure. It's crazy. So uh, since we're talking about value in art, well, I want to know, like, in your opinion, why do you think when an artist dies, the value of their paintings skyrockets to a way, like to a point where it's just like unimaginable? Yeah, I think it's just about like basic economics. It's like supply and demand, because mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're not going to have any more Andy Warhol works, you know? So I think all of a sudden everybody's like, oh no, there's a small amount out there and I need one. And so the prices follow. I wow. really think that's the vast majority of what happens after an artist dies. Do, what do you think? Yeah. Like, yeah, I guess it does fall back into exclusivity. Exclusive, is that how you say exclusive? Yeah, 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 you said right. it right. <laughs> uh, so do you think this is a good thing per se or what's your whole opinion on that situation? Oh, I think it's really hard because I, uh, I'm someone who wants art to be as accessible as possible for mm. as many people as possible. And the money side of the art world makes that really hard because even a museum like the North Carolina Museum of Art, which is really like a mid-sized museum, we're not in a major city. We're not on, you know, we're on the coast, we're on the East Coast, but it's not New York, it's not DC, it's not Boston. We're in the South. It's not a major art place. Um, and we don't have 
the big money and big donors that people do in New York institutions or even LA or San Francisco. <laughs> and so we aren't able to move that quickly to get a work of art the way that other people are. So we're, wow. um, you know, we're an institution, we're a museum and even us, like we're hemmed in by money too. So it's really tough. Um, mm -hmm. If it were up to me, I think that I would just want things to be in as many public institutions as possible or at least to be, if it's going to be in a private institution, I would want the opportunity to have that work of art tour in some way so that it can go visit museums around the world so that people oh, can wow. experience it. Um, because that's kind of the problem a lot of times is that people will buy works of art and then it becomes this like black hole that the work goes into. Uh, I've been thinking a lot recently, I've been doing some programs about Frida Kahlo, who is one of the, I think, most popular artists of the last century. And I'm thinking that Madonna, for example, owns or used to own, I can't remember if she sold it, I think she still owns a very famous Frida Kahlo painting, but she never lends it. So it hasn't been seen in public in like 20 years wow. because it just went into the dark hole of being in her house. And so it's a gain for her, but then it's a loss for us because we don't get to experience it. And how do you balance that? I think it's really tough. Wow, well, I definitely I don't agree think, with you on that. I don't think that's that's. I mean, that's fair or right for the artist himself. I'm sure the artist even didn't want, intend for their piece to end up in some rich person's house. I know. Um, I think it's yeah. weird because sometimes mm -hmm. it's like they want to. It's like artists are small business owners as well, you know, and they want to. <laughs> They want to get as much money as they can for their stuff too. But I agree. It's, I think there's so much that can be said for saying, you know, like, oh, I went to this gallery and I got to experience this piece with my family and it was really cool versus just knowing that something is out, out of reach. It's also unfortunate that they don't get to see the success of their paintings when they're alive. Like it happens after they die. So it's like they get to lose out on the, on that feeling like, yes, like my painting made it somewhere, you know, like it, it left an impact or, mm -hmm. or something like that. So yeah, I feel like it's just bad for the artist. But they, they were driven. They yeah. love doing it. They yeah, love they doing it. Love Maybe doing they it. didn't really <laughs> care yeah. much about the fame and glory more as so as to just send out their message. Like, no, 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 no. I didn't mean fame and glory, but yeah, like, as in like, like the impact it can have on people, you know, like when people see paintings, they sometimes they can have an emotional attachment or like, have yeah. this interaction with the painting and just like react in a way where they they really love this painting not necessarily as in fame and glory but and i'm pretty sure there's a lot of artists like because like in, in music you have these you have the these artists that just want to connect with their audience through their music through their lyrics i'm pretty sure also art painters uh, painters and uh, artists like when you say artists it's just like yeah it's like a broad statement <laughs> like, so it's someone who paints yeah, yeah it's just a very broad term nowadays so exactly like they want to see how like the impact it has on the, their audience i think that's really one of the most important things if not the number one most important thing that's why artists are artists that's why people create it's because you want to make something that has an impact in some way so i agree with you i think for the vast majority of artists that's enough I mean, in a fair world, I would love it if every creator could make a living being a creator. It's not always the case. Um, and only I think really a select few people actually do get fame and glory and all the big bucks during their lifetime. But I think the vast majority of artists that I know are just kind of normal people who say, I just feel the need to do this. I just want to make these sculptures. I just want to do these paintings. And I like to show them and if I sell one awesome but if i don't i'm gonna do it anyway because i want to and i want to create so i think that's the big thing mm -hmm. where wow. do you think the need for creating comes from like where does it stem from this need to express in that kind of form in a specific like where do you think this really comes from I feel like that's one of those esoteric questions. That <laughs> that's I a really hard know question. To. Like, <laughs> like, Van, uh, like Van Gogh. Please, like, though. Like Van Gogh, for example. Why does, like, he was yeah. mad, <laughs> right? He put himself yeah. in an in institution, right? <laughs> so, yep. um, cut off his ears. Well. Yeah. Why would he like, want to keep expressing himself through art like that? 
Well, I know for sure that Van Gogh is such an interesting case because it's like we're psychoanalyzing this guy. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. That is, yeah, it's true. But it's true. <laughs> it is true, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny. I feel like I can't see Van Gogh in a clear light anymore because I've been thinking about him and like the idea <laughs> of the tortured genius for so long <laughs> that it's all blurry in my brain. But it's really interesting. Like he he was somebody who had an interest in art and he had a family connection to it in that his brother who was really his best friend in the world eventually became an art dealer and it was really his brother who said you know i, I think you should be an artist like try to see if you can make it as an artist but before that it wasn't until he was almost 30 that he made that decision he was <laughs> himself what? an art dealer yeah. yeah it's like he came late at life where he was well, late at life but you know yeah. later <laughs> coming to his idea of I what I want to do with my life um so I think he felt I would say a few different reasons why he kept creating in the midst of all the turmoil that was going on in his life I think that he was just trying so hard to make a living that he just felt like the more he did and the more he put out in the world that like something would hit um it didn't at least not quite to the degree that he would have liked and certainly i think any of us today would would have thought was reasonable um but then i wonder there's that drive that you guys are talking about also that like deep sort of weird spiritual thing that i you know I don't know what birds think. I don't know what dogs think, but I have to say that I think that's really that intangible thing that really has, has us as humans stand out mm -hmm. is because that creative impulse, I don't know. It seems like it's from the beyond in so many ways. Wow. I would say yeah. like maybe it's just people trying to, okay, so when you express yourself with your words, you, you leave this temporary effect on people. So like people, okay, they, you say like, I'm sad right now. I'm, I'm angry. Like, or this is my opinion about this, uh, about Trump, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but your words basically are going to be a, a short, like they're going to be remembered for a short time. So yeah. I feel like when people want to be creative, they want to find a way to leave their impression for a long-term period. So they create this thing, which is tangible and it's, uh, you know, physical physically available for people to decipher or understand so, like for example when when writing was first created why was it created so that people can write down their stories and create basically history you know right. t history books and people so that people can look back and see what happened in the past yeah. that there can be recordings so art is in the same way but for emotions i mean this is how i i would see it so i don't know if what, what would you think I love that and I completely agree with you because it is hard, you know, like how do we leave our legacies behind? And especially before there were things like cameras and Zoom and you know, <laughs> blogs and yeah. everything like that. Um, you're right in that there had to be something tangible and something physical that people could leave behind. And I love that. I think that's totally right. And you're, I think you hit it on the head directly but talking about emotion because for mm -hmm. me that's the big thing <laughs> is that emotional connection it's right. true mm -hmm. and i think you were also talking ali about i know there's two ali's but you know like um <laughs> you were talking about the hey. stories behind it you Wait, know, Ali, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like brady bunch in my, <laughs> my screen here <laughs> but you're talking about like the story behind art and that's i think for me where that emotional connection is like as mm -hmm. much as i love a picture of a tree or some flowers, it's ultimately sometimes just a tree or a picture of flowers, but having the story behind it, if it was, you know, like a dad painted this for his little girl on her fifth birthday, it's like all of a sudden it becomes that thing that you have that emotional connection to. Mm -hmm. And that just is what has that, wow. um, you make that link. It I becomes guess. something you in that moment you know what jennifer i really do wish when i go into a museum i could hear your voice just explaining to me all the pieces <laughs> of art that i see because it really is true when i go to a museum and look at pieces of art they're just uh, it looks really cool like that but you don't really know the story and it's really hard to know the story yeah unless there's someone who really knows the story and tells you what the story is so, and i feel the same way by the way mm -hmm. you're not alone in that i even somebody who does this for a living like i feel <laughs> that way too mm -hmm. It's crazy because it can be really hard and i think right. there's this limit so long now um we've had this battle like so often in my museum because 
there have been all these studies about people going into museums and that they only spend like 30 seconds looking at a single work of art before moving on to the next one. And then if anything, they'll only read a wall label 50% of the time. And so it's, how do you tell the story about what a work of art is about? Or, and, and that's even one thing. It's like, who gets to decide what a work of art is about? Because an artist could say like, this is a painting of my grandmother. And you could be like, well, that reminds me of a rainy day. And you know, it, it both are valid. Um, but when you only have a tiny bit of time to capture somebody's attention, and you only have like 150 words on the wall to explain it, it's really hard to build that same emotional impact and that same connection. And I don't have an answer. It's like, that's a constant struggle for museum people. Do they not put plaques of like, what an art or the story behind the art is? Do they not do that or? You know what, it depends on the institution. Like sometimes there are some galleries that don't put anything on the walls. Like really? there's a, yeah, there's a place outside of DC, a relatively new um, art park called Glenstone. I've never been, but I've heard about it from other curators that I know. And there are no labels on the walls. There's just the artwork. And so if you know what you're looking at, you're like, great, that's <laughs> a so-and-so. But otherwise you're just looking. Um, and I, I see some of the value in that, but it's also difficult because again, that emotional connection of knowing the background or being able to get into it in a different way. I don't know. It's really rough. I think it, is. it could be applying to a niche market maybe since like they're only, they're trying to show it to people who actually know art or are able to interpret art. While yeah. this, for me, I would say that like, this is kind of restricting it to a specific group of people who know about art and this and not including the novices who are trying to get into it or trying to understand uh, exactly. what what this art is trying to say. Maybe. Exactly. Or maybe it's just, I guess it might be also a kind of thing where it's like art is interpreted by the eyes that behold it, maybe. Oh, no. Totally. Like, cause <laughs> yeah. I can tell you what this is or I can leave it maybe to you to touch into that aspect in your brain to right. interpret it in your own way, see how you feel about it. But then again, yeah. I, like that leaves the, like it would work for people who are emotionally intact with themselves and know how to feel. What about someone maybe like me? I mean, my emotions run down to like around three or four and that's about it, right? So I don't know. <laughs> like, I can't, I'll see an artwork, I'll be like, cool, right? But when I know the story, I'll be like, Interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, very, that's yeah. Too. you know what I mean? So I don't know. It's very, it's a very gray mm -hmm. area. I think it's, it's hard. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you balance that? And how do you know? Because especially if you're trying to look at a big audience of people across the board, it's like, how do you know how much is too much? How much is too little? And it's really hard. You want to give people the opportunity to experience it based on where they are. And that can be such a broad range. <laughs> um, I always personally like to err on the side of giving you more information and you can choose to ignore it uh, if you want. And then if you want more, it's there for you so that you don't have to like go searching for it. But not a lot of people always agree with that. Some people do want to have that like pure aesthetic experience where they're not being told anything, not even the title or the artist or the date it was made. So it really comes down, I think, to personal preference in so many ways. Wow. It's, uh, we came hoping to get answers. Now we just have more questions. <laughs> anyway, no, that's, how, I that's how I feel. And that's, that's art. art. That, art. Is that is art. art. That is art. art. <laughs> that's more our art. Yeah. You, right? Is it, uh, does it get more, like, the more you get into it, um, does it clear out more or does it get more confusing, do you think? <laughs> um, good. Um, <laughs> both? Is that both. possible to say that both? Is possible. It is possible. Because <laughs> I, I guess when you like answer one thought. question, it leaves <laughs> yes. the door to many more questions that can be asked exactly. about that answer, right? So mm -hmm. it's, exactly. I think, I think we should stop like being so concerned about all this stuff and just start to appreciate art more, maybe, mm -hmm. right? And just you know be like wow that's pretty cool right so uh, we have i think we've hit our timestamp, have we i want to ask jennifer one more thing about being interested in art uh what are some of the pieces that uh you saw that really left an impression on you um like pieces of art that you were like you really had a connection with that's such a good question i would say early on 
um, one of my first art experiences ever, before I even knew that what I was doing was learning about art history, was when I was in high school, I had a religion teacher, like a theology teacher in school. And one day he sort of broke ranks in the middle of, I don't even know what we were talking about. It was just like a Christian theory kind of course or something that we were all asked to take. And he brought in, this was in the 90s, so it was real old school. He brought in a slide projector, a slide carousel, and showed images of Edvard Munch, the Norwegian painter who did like, you know, the scream, the ah painting. <laughs> um, <laughs> he showed all these different images of this guy's work. And I had never really known anything about him except for the screen painting. And I think it was one of those moments where it was just connecting again to that emotional element because a lot of his works, some of them are autobiographical and some aren't. Yeah, exactly <laughs> like this. But this is really interesting. We could talk about this real quick. This is an autobiographical oh. painting oh, wow. <laughs> that was based on an experience he had of standing on this bridge in Oslo and he saw this incredible sunset and it made him feel this almost like manic crisis moment. And it's been discussed that perhaps this was based on um, a moment in time where there was a volcanic eruption and it created this like mass of clouds that traveled to, into Europe and that it created these incredible, like amazing sunsets. And but this was the late 19th, early 20th century, and there was still a lot of superstition about what that kind of weather event could have meant. And so I think he had this like mental breakdown in that moment. Um, <laughs> and so I think seeing his works for the first time and having my teacher just talk about this guy's life and the kind of works he was creating, that was that big, one of the first big moments for me, that connection. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Well, Great story. Learning something new every day. You do. And, Welcome uh, to the YouTube show. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, this was such a good episode. I enjoyed this. So thank you very much for watching another episode of A to the Show. If you guys enjoyed this episode half as much as we enjoyed filming, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe and share. share with someone. We'll leave a link to yeah. Jennifer's <laughs> comments social media. and interact with us. True, because we read all our comments, by the <laughs> yes. way. Uh, if you guys want to know. This is two way street. Comment. Let us know yeah, what you think. Let us know what you think, and we'll let you know what we think about what you think. And hey, who knows? <laughs> we'll have a thing Uh yes. Jennifer, we'll leave a link to her stuff, social medias, uh, yes. her podcast. The podcast, yeah. Stuff. You should mm -hmm. definitely go check it out. Check it out. Jennifer, is there anything you'd like to shout out or let the world know? Art Curious, wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you guys so much. This check was it out. really fun. This was fun for us too. Well, yeah. it's been a pleasure. <laughs> We're like, right. She said it. Like, subscribe, <laughs> share. I'll see ya. Peace. Woo. Rain.